Coming up on this edition of The Climate Show, Durban is just around the corner and some nations are already starting to talk it down. Plus, the emails are coming back to haunt us once again. Is it Climate Gate Part 2? Gareth, we've also got a, um, a great guest on. Yeah, we have. We've got uh, Dr James Renwick from NIWA. He's going to talk to us about the IPCC's latest report, the special report on climate extremes. Plus, we also talk about rooftop solar. That is all coming up on this edition of The Climate Show. This episode of The Climate Show is brought to you by hot-topic.co.nz, sideblogs.co.nz, skepticalscience.com, scoop.co.nz, idealog.co.nz, and KiwiFM. Hi there, and welcome along to The Climate Show. This is episode number 22, recording 23rd of November 2011. It's a show all about climate science, news, policy, politics, and solutions as well. And uh, I'm your host, Glenn Williams, here at uh, the uh, Kiwi FM studios in Auckland City. And my co-host, of course, is Gareth Renaldin in Waipara at hot-topic.co.nz. Hey, Gareth, how you doing? I'm very well, Glenn. It's um, a nice rainy day down here, so I don't feel guilty about being in the office talking to you. Right. Um, I do. The sun is streaming through my window. It's lovely up here. <laughs> I should be out there rubbing buds on my in my little vineyard. Crikey, are you allowed probably... to do that? What? Is that rubbing? legal? You have, you have to rub buds. Do you? Did you not know this? <laughs> no idea, no. <laughs> what are you talking about? No, well, it's... It's, well, you see, the, the, the vines are very vigorous things, and they tend to have buds everywhere. And, and we go along in the winter and we cut off you know, all the last season's growth because we want them to have the right number of buds in the right places. But then they have these things called trunks that go into the ground, you know, where the roots are. Yeah. And buds form on these trunks, so you have to go along and clean all, clean all those off. Otherwise, you end up with shoots growing out at all sorts of crazy angles and taking vigour away from the seems, stuff that you want to grow. Seems so terribly cruel. I'm sure there's a, some kind of plant society that would be unhappy about the way <laughs> the vines are being treated. <laughs> no, you, you know, every, everything that's really good, you have to suffer for. <laughs> yeah, sure. Okay, well, we, um, we, 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 we go our, through our fair share of suffering to bring the show to you, but it is always a pleasure once we get it out. And um, I'm determined that we're recording on the 23rd, and I'm going to get it all finished on the 23rd. Um, so, so be prepared uh, for the show to come out really, really quick. Um, that's, I'm talking to you there, Gareth, because it's going to it's going to happen quite quickly. <laughs> that means I have to do the show notes tonight. Yeah, oh, yeah. dear. Right? Okay. And I will do our best. We'll do our best. Let's keep this one really hot and up to the minute glenn indeed so yeah we've got a few in, we've got a few interesting things to talk about on the show today our guest uh, interviewer uh, our guest interviewee is uh, dr james renwick from the national institute of water and atmospheric research uh, new zealand's niwa the uh, atmospheric science uh, he's the principal climate scientist there and we're going to talk to him about the ipcc's uh, special report on climate extremes, which came out last week. So that's a pleasure to get Jim on the show, and I'm looking forward to talking to him. We're cookless this week. We are not cooking with gas. We are cooking with nothing. So um, we'll be skipping our debunking the skeptics uh, section this week, sadly. Yeah, unfortunately. Got, we will have the solutions we, in there, though. Yeah, we've got a few solutions, a few interesting things to talk about, and we've there's some hot news to talk about so uh, mm. let's take it away shall we Glenn? Yep in the meantime I will tell you though that if you come across this show and it wasn't on the website um, there is a home for the climate show it's theclimateshow.com and also hot-topic.co.nz and that's where those notes that uh, Gareth has just been talking about will be up with all the links to everything we're talking about and the links to download different versions and share it around uh, also we're on the various social media websites like facebook.com forward slash ready whammo and twitter.com forward slash ready whammo. Yes indeed into the news uh durban is on the way the um the, the new the, the latest round of climate talks um but uh as as it always as always happens there's a um uh, a discussion i suppose before the discussions and uh this time the rich nations are saying are almost almost uh, like they're trying to cut cut off the talks at, at, at the knee before they even happen they're coming out saying that they're not 
They're not even going to um, come up with a deal this time. In fact, it may be years away, Gareth. Yeah, that was possibly one of the most depressing news items I've read recently was a piece by Fiona Harvey in The Guardian last week uh, where she says that rich, rich nations could give up on a climate treaty until 2020, um, which is disastrous news because we know the... The, the science tells us that if we're going to have any chance whatsoever of staying under a, a, a two degrees Celsius rise in temperature on the global average, we're going to need to have um, emissions peaking and beginning to fall by the time you get to 2020. So to somehow postpone it all, put it in the too hard basket for eight years, to lose eight years when emissions are growing as rapidly as they are at the moment, and we'll, we'll talk about that a bit later on, um, is storing up a world of hurt for us. I was really profoundly depressed when I read that piece. Um, I suggest everybody does it. In fairness, I suspect that um, Fiona Harvey was putting quite a strong case um, she was she was sort of being controversial almost for the sake of it. The the, the Guardian printed a letter um, a week or two or a few days later from Chris Hune, who's the Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change, and he described the article as being a bit of a misrepresentation of the UK's position. And he says that they want to reach agreement on the need for a new treaty and to set it out uh, set out a timetable to be concluded no later than 2015 and that they recognise that global emissions need to be peaking by 2020. So that, in a sense, I suspect um, Fiona Harvey was kind of overstating the, the, the real situation for kind of dramatic effect, for, for news impact. But there is no doubt that there, is, um, there are several sort of strands of disagreement going on. Um, the developing countries, the so-called Annex One countries, the ones that um, are not currently... Um, required under Kyoto to, to make any cuts, uh, want to see the Kyoto process continue. Um, the developed world um, doesn't want uh, or seems not to want um, Kyoto in its present form to continue. Yeah. Um, they're keen to do something else, to start from scratch. And they argue with, with some justification that China and India um, are now beginning to dominate global emissions and they should be involved in any kind of overreaching um, global deal. And out of the um, kind of the, 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 the developed world, there's beginning to be people saying, oh, well, let's not go for a big global deal. Well, let's just sort of yeah. do every country will do its own thing. And, you know, somehow it'll all be all right at the end of the day because we'll all recognize that we need to do something and all we'll get things going and we can cobble something together at the end of the day. And in fairness, I don't particularly like that argument because I do recognize that, you know, countries like New Zealand, Australia and so on, the people who are actually doing something at the moment or beginning to do things mm. um, are doing so because they'll get some kind of advantage out of it in the long term. China, for instance, is beginning to dominate the world renewable energy market and it's doing so because it thinks it will make money doing that in the future. Um, so there is some merit in saying let's all go and do what we can and see what comes out at the end of the day. But I do think you need to have some kind of international deal on top of that to provide a framework, particularly in terms if we're going to be trading carbon, trading emissions in emissions trading schemes, um, then we need to have some sort of global framework within within which we can do that. Right. There, so there, that's. But there are some positive um, opinions out there, though, on what is going to happen at Durban, like um, Mark Linus, who is the advisor to the leadership of the low-lying Indian Ocean nation, the um, Maldives. Um, he, yeah, well, Mark yeah. Linus talks about this thing called the Katahina Dialogue, which is uh, it's not a formal group. It's a, it's a group of the smaller countries that get together. Uh, now there are over 30 countries. They, they met uh, recently in Santiago in Chile to talk about what they might be doing. Um, and so there are efforts going on um, kind of under, underground almost to try and make sure that the... the, the, the conferences of parties, which is what these annual conferences are technically called, um, actually do begin to deliver some, some serious uh, progress. Yeah. And I mean, the last one, the last one in Mexico did produce some good work on various things. And I've no doubt that whatever happens at Durban, there will be good work going on in the background, producing 
um, useful things. But w will we have headlines that the um, the whole process is is sort of somehow magically going to come up with a deal? Well, I don't think we will. And Fiona Harvey's article in the Guardian gives us a very good idea of why that might not be. At the same time. The European negotiator, who's a guy called John Prescott, who used to be a um, senior Labour politician in Britain, together with John Gammer and Michael Jay, they um, wrote a, an opinion piece which was published in the, the New Zealand Herald and quite widely around the world um, a few days ago. They were, they're talking about um, lots of opportunities in Durban. They, they, they call Dur the outlook for Durban is highly uncertain, but that there is a critical mass of countries that are advancing. Uh, what they call landmark domestic climate change legislation at, at a pace that contrasts sharply with the UN brokered talks. And they talk about China developing comprehensive climate change legislation. It's got carbon targets in its latest five-year plan. Um, South Africa has released its climate change white paper. In Mexico, all of the political parties have agreed to work together to, to come up with a climate change law. South Korea is in the process of passing legislation for an ETS. Um, Australia, of course. Uh, Germany's got a new radical, a radical new energy plan, um, mainly because it doesn't want to uh, go with nuclear. So there's a, there's a hell of a lot going on. Yeah, uh, but but I guess and I guess yeah, all of this kind of toing and froing and umming and ahhing um, ignores the facts um, that that you know the, the the science is firm and um, and some alarming statistics out there, of course, about as we talked about in the last episode. The amount of CO two that's being released into the atmosphere, nothing has changed. No, the there's precious little sign of any significant slowdown in uh, the emissions being released to the atmosphere. Um, you a global recession, you might expect, would um, slow the, um, the the growth rate of carbon and, and other greenhouse gases in the in the atmosphere, but there's you know really not very much sign of that. The World Meteorological Organization has just released its um, annual uh, greenhouse gas uh, uh, sort of summary. Um, I'm just trying to get this up on my screen. Where has it gone? Here we are. Um, it's the um, no. Hang on, I've lost it now. The greenhouse gas bulletin, is it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Where am I? What have I done with that? Ah, here we are. Yes, the greenhouse gas bulletin, the, the annual um, green, they produce it every year. And uh, this one's dated the 21st of November 2011. And what they're doing is just summarizing where we are in terms of the amount of greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. And we reached 389 parts per million of um, CO2 in 2010, which was a rise of 2.3 parts per million over the previous year. Hmm. And the total forcing from the um, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere just continues to increase. Methane's rising, uh, nitrous, nitrous oxide is, is uh, increasing. Um, so the, the impact that these gases are having at trapping heat, keeping it closer to the surface of the planet, um, is not stopping. Hmm. Is you know it, it, it's continuing to increase, and if we're going to have any hope of um, stabilizing the the climate system at an acceptable uh, amount of heat in the system, we've got to stop that emissions growth first of all. So we've got to um, reduce the rate at which emissions increase. We've got to make it plateau so that we arrive at a steady amount of carbon in the atmosphere, and that's got to we've got to stabilize that at a level below one which will ultimately cause uh, significant greenhouse damage and we then have to begin to cut that level back yeah because we need to get down below uh, wherever we peak and if we're going to try and keep some sort of semblance of the climate that human civilization has kind of grown up with because if so we, we've got well, because because if we do, well, I was just saying because we don't if we don't, it leads on to the next story about about um, hyperwarming. <laughs> yeah, that really fairly depressing. Piece. I, I, well, I must stop doing all these depressing programs, Glenn. We talked about depression last week, but <laughs> yeah, absolutely. The, the 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 New Scientist magazine in their seventeenth November issue um, had a little feature called "Hyperwarming Climate Could Turn Earth's Poles Green," and basically what um, this is talking about is that. If we're not careful, uh, 
increasing greenhouse gas levels in our atmosphere could trigger us into um, a sort of huge warming, which ends up with tropical jungles at the at the north at the North Pole and see the end of the Antarctic ice sheet. Uh, uh, nobody's suggesting this is about to happen in the next 20 years. This no. is something that could ha- you know, take a few hundred years, maybe a thousand years to happen. But what they're warning is that once we're on that road, uh, we may not be able to put the genie back in the bottle, as it, as it were. Yeah. Uh, we could end up with triggering. Um, they've they've, in, they've uh, enumerated a, a number of things that could happen. One of the things that interested me was that as sea levels rise, apparently... Um, shallow seas over over what used to be land are very efficient at trapping um, extra heat. They warm up very quickly. Hmm. And um, this could have an effect, uh, you know, add to the, if you like, the warming effect of just the amount of uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And then there are various other biological feedbacks. There's the methane feedback where melting permafrost and so on chucks a lot of methane and ultimately carbon dioxide into the air. Mm. So we know that in previous warm spells, going back to the um, Eocene 34 million years ago, um, temperatures at the North Pole were warm enough for palm trees and crocodiles and so on to survive. And that's just that, you know, we ought to take that fairly seriously as a, if we're not careful. But the problem is be... people hear that, they think, they think, so, well, that sounds nice. We go on holiday to... <laughs> To the Arctic, can't we? But but they don't realise so that that means possibly uh, yeah, a soupy ocean, right? An ocean that is not the ocean that we know today. It's this it's this uh, ultra nutrient rich ocean that is only that only has like jellyfish and and um, weird creepy things in there, rather than the nice blue oceans that we see today. I think you should be using Latin. I I, I would like to know the Latin for weird creepy things. <laughs> 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 Guess I can come up. Yep. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, it, a, a planet that has a jungle at the North Pole. Mm. Um, well, what's going to happen to the jung- the jungles in the um, in the tropics? Um, well, they're deserts, we could, aren't they? You, well, it may be. You may get huge um, huge deserts. You may get um, very humid air that makes it impossible for humans as they currently are to cool themselves off so mm. large parts of the planet may become completely uninhabitable that's if there are any humans around in those times to to actually yeah. see what happens to see the uh, the fruits of of our foolishness so um yeah it's hyper warming not something to worry about um today tomorrow but it's as a possible consequence of things that we do today worth thinking about perhaps mm. so let's not distract ourselves with real science right now gareth let's distract ourselves with the politics of science and the <laughs> uh, of climate science and the and the distractions from the skeptics yes another fresh round of hacked climate science emails have just been leaked online this week yeah absolutely i woke up this morning um to find um that uh, my emails were my inbox was absolutely stuffed with emails discussing um, the release of another batch of, of emails from the, uh, the, the the theft of basically a, a whole server's worth, a whole probably a decade's worth or more of emails from the Climatic Research Unit at the University of East Anglia. And those seem to have been put out onto the net um, in the last uh, 24 hours or so. And now, of course, the sceptics are all over the place, desperately trying to claim that there's another scandal in the offing. If regular listeners to The Climate Show will know that um, in the run-up to Copenhagen, um, about a week before the American holiday Thanksgiving uh, in 2009, a stack of emails were, were um, released uh, which came from they were they were genuine emails they'd been stolen from a server at the um, University of East Anglia mm. and they the people who had stolen them had made a selection of emails that um, they were all s- supposedly showed the scientists um, trying to hide declines in temperature and colluding to prevent skeptics having work published and basically they they tried to whip it up into a huge scandal to claim that you know climate science was corrupt and and so on yeah and the usual suspects the the, the skeptical bloggers the uh, right-wing think tanks the u.s politicians managed to get um, 
huge amount of kind of play out of this climate gate story as they dubbed it and bang so it was a huge huge thing over the end of 2009 and into 2010 mm. and it led to probably um, at least three and perhaps as many as nine investigations of what was going on at least nine investigations that were somehow tangentially tangentially related to um to the state the, the stolen emails yeah and Every one of those investigations found that there was really nothing to answer. Maybe some of the emails, some of the people in the emails had been uh, perhaps a little unwise in, in their approach to freedom of information requests and uh, would have to tighten up their procedures in that respect. But in practice, there was nothing shonky about the science. The emails made no case um, for somehow um, a collusion. Uh, you know, th th there was some, sound of, some sort of conspiracy of scientists who... Uh, hide the the real facts of of climate change. Mm. Now, the guys who did that, it seems to have been they, it was investigated by the Norfolk Police, but they uh, have found very little. It seems in two years of work, um, they basically stole the whole stack of emails, and the people who went through them and selected the emails for release in two thousand and nine seem to have now gone through the remaining emails right. and picked out about 5,000 that they're going to release to the world. And, you know, surprise, surprise, they've done it just before uh, another UN meeting. They've done it just before Thanksgiving. But what they've had left to work with is really, you know, pretty thin stuff. It's kind of warmed over. I, I, it's a hot topic I call it, you know, a two-year-old turkey dinner because that's what it is. Um, People are the, over at the skeptic blogs, they're desperately trying to work themselves up into a, um, a frenzy about this, but mm. they're having to work themselves up into a frenzy about you know, emails that were written in 2002, 2003, where, where scientists were sort of disagreeing about early drafts of chapters of the, um, the, the IPC's fourth report. The, the, it has absolutely zero relevance with respect to the science that's being done now, yeah. to what we know now, to what we observe in in the um, in the in the climate system, and I'd like to draw attention. I'll put this in the show notes, but and I, I haven't got it on the page for you to load because it. I only read this just shortly before we started recording. But uh, Stefan Lewandowski, the um, Australian uh, professor of cognitive science at the University of Western. Australia. Steve's written a great piece at the Aussie site, The Conversation, and he says, it's headlines, interesting, there's a real climate gate out there. And he runs through the climate gate things, he runs through the Amazon gate, Himalaya gate, IPCC things, and then he points out where the real climate gate is. The, it was with the um, Competitive Ent Enterprise Institute who um, tried to uh, steal emails. Um, they're Ken Cuccinelli in Virginia launching frivolous lawsuits against Michael Mann and the University of Virginia. Um, Inhofe trying to criminalize climate scientists. Uh, Bush trying to um, reduce or marginalize or mischaracterize climate change science, mm. or at least bu officials in the Bush administration. Um, this, this is the, the real climate gate is the campaign in the US and in the wider world to prevent us or to, you know, trying to stop us from doing something sensible about this problem. Because that needs to be and financed as well. That, that uh, anti-campaign, the money for that campaign and to pay the hackers and, and whoever to, to get this information has to be paid for. Absolutely. And we, we know there is very strong evidence. Um, it's out there. You know, you can read it. It's uh, proven that the right wing think tanks um, and their sort of supporters are funded by oil and fossil fuel interests and by some of the wealthiest individuals in America. And at a time when there's been the Occupy Wall Street and the so-called, you know, the 99% uh, versus the 1%. Mm. The 1% seems to have been funding an attempt to basically, uh, the, the, the effect of which will be to destroy the planet. And I find that, well, it's more than, you know, you, I could be polite about it and say it's reprehensible. I could swear, but I'm not going to. Mm. 
But I mean, to be honest, that's the real climate gate. Mm. Who are the people who are paying these people to criminalize climate scientists, to uh, run PR campaigns to try and prevent action? This is a really, really serious problem. And they're out there trying to sort of reheat old scandals to, to, for political effects. It's just yeah. rubbish. And that's what deserves the media attention, right? Not, not, not the reporting Absolutely. of these so-called climate gate emails. Yeah, absolutely. I hope there's some heat turned up on the Norfolk police in Britain because in two years they've done nothing. Um, they've made no public announcements. They seem to have made no progress whatsoever. Um, we really need to know um, who hacked that server. Um, my understanding is that the uh, police say it was a hack and not a leak, mm. but uh, that's about the best that we can know. We need to know who paid the people that did the hack we need to know who did the selection of the emails, who coordinated the release of them, and how was it that all of those bloggers and right-wing think tanks were all ready to run with stories when those first lot of climate gate emails came out. And then we can ask who released this lot and, uh, uh, in the last 24 hours. If you have any information uh, that might lead to the arrest of... Uh, of these individuals, please contact Gareth at hot hyphen topic. <laughs> <laughs> yes, anonymity guaranteed. <laughs> I, either that, or please turn yourself into PC Plod, care of the, um, yeah. the uh, Essex Police. No, the Norfolk Police, sorry. And you'll get a good talking anyway. to from Gareth. Um, right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, I think I think that's our that's our news. We're, we are going to talk a little bit more about this with uh, with Jim uh, Jim Renwick, our guest, very shortly. But uh, before we get him on, I do want to um, uh, thank and, and show some appreciation for our media partners, our supporters, idealog.co.nz in the sustain section. Thanks very much to them for promoting the show. Also, cyblogs.co.nz, a great community of um, science bloggers from all around New Zealand. They've got a great um, science podcast there as well. You should check out. That's, that's cyblogs.co.nz and uh, scoop.co.nz as well, independent news here in New Zealand. Thanks very much to those guys for promoting the show. Okay, well, um, it's I'm really, like, really glad to get um, the, our next guest on the show because I've had him lined up in the climate show sites for quite a while. It's uh, Dr. James Renwick, or as I call him, Jim. Um, I know him through the... Um, the Meteorological Society of New Zealand, and uh, Jim is a principal climate scientist at NIWA. He's been a uh, an IPCC lead author. Um, he's you know top of the tree in terms of climate scientists in New Zealand. And he's done a tremendous amount of good work in um, coming to public meetings around the country, even to the Amberley Library. I remember on one occasion. So welcome to the Climate Show, Jim. Well, thanks, Gareth. Very nice to be here. Excellent. Now, Glenn and I have just been talking about this um, so-called Climate Gate 2, the, the, mm. the sort of second tranche of emails uh, released from the, the guys who stole them from, from the CRU in East Anglia. And I just wanted to see what uh, your take on all this was. Well, it's pretty underwhelming, I would say. Two years down the track, there's been a release of some more emails or a re-release of some old ones. I'm not sure which. Um, and yeah there's nothing new there i'm thinking the people behind this must be getting pretty desperate if the best they can do is to try and rerun a non-event from two years ago so i haven't seen a lot of uptake in the media yet the usual blogosphere stuff of course but i don't think it's really going to go anywhere this time around well i certainly hope not i mean my i haven't actually had time to look at any of the emails and i i sort of feel kind of dirty when I do that because this is people's private correspondence that we're being asked to trawl through um, but it looks as though I mean how can you get worked up about a few scientists exchanging a few sort of uh, pithy comments about 10 year old papers I mean it's, it strikes me as ludicrous really well yeah it's a bit beside the point of the actual science isn't it like all people who exchange emails and I would guess scientists probably are at the milder end of what gets exchanged in emails. Um, you know, it's all very chatty and uh, more about people than about the science, I would say. So it's, it's, it's not something that's really that useful to be looking at if you're worried about climate change science. Yes, exactly. It's, it's um, clearly um, all part of a, a PR campaign to try and 
you know, derail action. Anyway, yeah. um, well, I, I just want to want to ask something about that though. Will it hinge on the media's response to this? I mean, that how how seriously it's taken and how much you know damage, if any, that it does. It does it hinge basically on the media now? To a certain extent, I think it always does. Everything does in a way in terms of public perceptions. If it was picked up and made a big drama of by some some of the bigger media outlets, then I guess, sure, there could be more to come and more controversy and so on. Um, but I just don't see that happening this time. Hmm. Okay. Okay, well, um, one of the things that we hope ClimateGate 2, um, if that <laughs> seems to be what everybody's calling it, doesn't distract from was the release um, last week of the IPCC special report on managing the risks of extreme events and disasters to advance climate change ad adaptation. As ever, the IPCC has come up with a really sort of um, catchy little title, mm. um, but it's called SREX, and it's looking at extreme weather, which is something that... Um, Glenn and I have talked about, uh, uh, not quite in every show, but probably every other show in the 22 that we've done. Mm -hmm. So, and Jim, you've been um, involved in this process. Uh, you're up to speed with what SREX is all about. Can you give us the, the, the potted summary, if you will? Uh, well, I'll try, yeah. <laughs> I, haven't been, I haven't been an author on the, the SREX, um, but uh, through my work as a lead author on the main IPCC reports. I'm familiar with some of the people involved and know the process, yeah. yeah. So again, what's happening is that it's a, a summary, an overview of what's in the literature, what's published and refereed and all that about uh, extreme events and how climate change is affecting the frequency and the intensity of extremes. So in a way, it's a pulling together of stuff that's been published in the IPCC, the main reports themselves, but just brought together into something that's a bit more digestible. Um, so there's not there's not a lot that, you know, like all of this IPCC stuff, there's no new research done specifically for a report like that. It's all what's published already. Um, but the focus is very much on the tales of the, of the distribution. So, you know, what what's happening with heavy rainfalls, droughts, heat waves, and so on. And hopefully it's put together in a, a reasonably digestible form, um, suitable for uh, policy makers, government officials and so on. Okay, so d just when we talk about climate, we, we're talking about weather statistics, aren't we? And mm -hmm. what's different about extremes is that they, by definition, don't, ver don't happen very often. And so it's mm. quite difficult to work out whether they're being affected by an underlying change of the climate. Now, is that a fair summary of what's going on? Well, that's, that's absolutely right. Extremes, by definition, are rare. Um, so that's one reason why it's hard to get a handle on trends in extremes, for instance. So you have to wait a long time to get a good record of, of very heavy rainfalls, etc. The other thing, I guess, is that in a lot of parts of the world, for instance, in New Zealand, the weather is so changeable, so dynamic, um, that there's, a, there's an awful lot of noise. And seeing a signal in the averages, that's relatively straightforward. Seeing a signal in the extremes with all the noise thrown on top, that, that becomes harder. So one, these events are pretty rare. And two, there's an awful lot of natural variability that contributes to extremes as well. So it can be quite difficult. And again, you need a very long record tease out uh, any sort of underlying trend or signal that's related to uh, human-induced climate change. Now, in the SREX, I think there, there are probably only two or three things where they point out that there is evidence that extremes have been um, increasing as a result of, um, or over the last 60 years. And one of those is hot days and hot nights, and the other is um, heavy rainfall. Can you uh, sort of give us an idea of what's going on there? Yeah, well, I guess the two areas where you see an effect most obviously, one is temperature. Um, that, that's the simplest variable, I suppose, and, and global warming is about uh, increasing temperatures. So trends in average temperatures are very clear all around the world. And when you increase the average temperature, you push up the likelihood of getting an extreme 
warm day or period and you decrease the likelihood of getting a, a cold spell and that's you know that's pretty straightforward and understandable and it's quite easy to measure um, and for instance on a seasonal basis temperatures uh, don't vary from the average um, by more than a degree or two so getting a, a summer that's two degrees warmer than normal is is a very rare event but if yeah. you increase the average temperatures by two degrees which is likely to happen in New Zealand over the next few decades then you know every summer will be two degrees warmer than present so you can see that you know the frequency of an extreme like that of a of a very warm summer goes up pretty dramatically if you increase the mean temperature. So it's quite easy to detect that kind of thing um, relatively. One other area where changes in extremes are very obvious, maybe not so much with heavy rain, although that, that's true in some parts of the world, not so much over New Zealand, but sea level rise and the, um, the risk of extreme high tides or high water uh, has increased or is increasing um, around the world. Again, in New Zealand, sea level rise is going at about the global average. So it's currently at about three millimetres per year. And um, the risks of extreme high water coastal inundation go up quite rapidly with increasing sea level. It's not so much that the mean sea level is so many millimetres higher than it was before. Again, it's, it's what you add on top of that or where the tail of the, the distribution gets to. So you increase the sea level by a certain amount and then you put a, a king tide on top of that and you put a, a storm on top of that again. Uh, a small increase in the mean sea level can lead to a much bigger risk of inundation in low-lying coastal areas. And, so presi- that's obviously an issue in parts of New Zealand, but it's obviously mm. a huge issue for mm. um, our Pacific neighbours. Uh, indeed. I mean, any any area that's low-lying and coastal, and by definition, a lot of, a lot of the Pacific Islands are, not all, there's, there's plenty of volcanic um, islands that have you know plenty of ground well above sea level, but a lot of them are atolls or, or very low-lying islands that may be the the highest point is only a matter of two to five metres above sea level. So yeah. raising sea level by a metre, say, which is very on the cards this century, would increase the risk of, you know, of <clears throat> the island almost being washed away in some senses. Although that, that's a really interesting question. There was some nice work done last year, I'm not sure if you've covered it, on looking at changes in the area of islands in the Pacific and changes in the winds and, and so on have actually helped to build up some atolls, some islands, while others have been eaten away. So it's not quite the case that everywhere disappears under the waves in an inexorable kind of way. But yeah. certainly, as, as the sea level rises, yeah, it becomes a much bigger risk the lower lying you are. One of the things that struck me um, about the report uh, probably more so than its coverage of the recent scientific literature was the, <coughs> the way that it looked at how all of these things work together to uh, create sort of fairly dramatic impacts on human populations. So if we, mm. if we think of a Pacific island, even though it may have a kind of volcanic mountain at the, at the centre, all mm. the hotels are actually built on the beaches. <laughs> and so the, um, yeah. yeah, that's, that's so right. So you I get mean, that impact, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not just the the risk from the climate or weather event, it's the exposure, the vulnerability, and um, humans are very good at putting infrastructure <laughs> in risky places, you know, building on the coast is a classic, so you're absolutely right, yeah, the hotels tend to be by the beach, um, so we, we don't do ourselves any favours there, um, I guess. In New Zealand, at least some regional authorities are planning for a what's called a managed retreat from the coast. Um, I guess in the Pacific that can happen too if there are places to retreat too. So yeah. you, you'd think that a place like Christchurch that's going through um, a rebuild would be factoring mm-hmm. this into their plans. You would think so, yeah. <laughs> but hope. but are they? That's the question, isn't it? Are they? Well, that, it is a good question. and I, I haven't pushed hard to find the answer to that. I haven't heard any discussion of it. Um, I have wondered. But um, I'm not aware that it's a big consideration, no. Hmm. Hmm. So, um, looking forward then, the the report summarises where we are and it looks at the way that the 
the sort of extreme weather events work with populations to create sort of damaging um, climate events. Mm -hmm. what's, what's in store for us uh, in the big picture, the global picture, before we talk about New Zealand, Jim? Boy, that's a, that's a broad question, Gareth. Um, <laughs> I'm good at those. Well, <laughs> yeah, good man. Um, a simple answer to that is just a riskier future. I think you you warm the climate the, the way climate change is working. You put more moisture into the air. So you, you increase the amount of energy in the climate system. Uh, that increases the chances of all kinds of extreme events, strong wind storms, heavy rainfall, hence landslides, coastal inundation, heat waves, etc., etc. Um, that doesn't mean there won't be some nice days in there as well, but the, the risks of getting the kind of extremes that we see now maybe once every few decades, we might be seeing those sort of extremes once every few years. Um, and that's, that's a general rule, I would say, whatever the ex extreme might be in the place you are. I mean, in one place it might be heavy rainfalls, in another place it might be droughts and so on. Um, so I, I think around the world, we're likely to just see a more extreme climate full stop without necessarily specifying which extreme is most important where. Yeah. Um, and, so and how the can way human society, sorry, sorry, how can human societies prepare for that, Jim? I mean, does that is this all about um, just you know, being resilient and trying to trying to be make ourselves able to recover? Um, to a certain extent, it is. Yeah, I mean, we do. We will have to be resilient to extremes. I mean, we already are to a certain extent. So it's a question of. Uh, beefing up that effort I guess and in different parts of the world um, changes in extremes will be different and there are, will doubtless be some places that aren't terrifically affected um, and others that are affected extremely badly so yes it's, it's adapting in the sense of becoming more resilient building defences where, uh, where that makes sense and where we can um, and learning to pick up the pieces afterwards uh, in a more timely fashion, I suppose. I mean, the, the ways you actually respond to some of these things are, are many and varied. I know I've, I've read some, some literature about um, populations, I think, in Eastern Africa, and, and you know, the, the dwellings tend to be, by our, our standards, pretty flimsy, and they tend to disappear in a big flood. Um, but that's just expected, and the people build again and again in a pretty flimsy sort of fashion. I'm not advocating this for New Zealand necessarily, but their way of coping with that kind of extreme is just to expect that it'll happen, that it'll wash away where they live, but that's fine because they'll just build it again after the flood goes away. So yeah. there are different ways of approaching these things. Um, <laughs> but the, the bottom line is that we will have to defend ourselves against these kind of extremes. So one example is locally where I live in Wellington that the council is looking at where they might be building seawalls over the next few decades to protect against high tides and storm surge and so on. And the area around near where the airport is is a prime candidate. It's fairly low lying. In fact, it was underwater before the 1855 earthquake, I think. Um, yeah. But it's a, it's a fairly significant population centre now and um, rather than abandon it, they're talking about uh, building walls, the, the sort of Dutch approach I suppose, build some dikes and keep the sea out that way. Yeah, absolutely. Well it, it doesn't, uh, uh, when I read the report I, I, I felt that it probably um, was being a little bit cautious in terms of its interpretation of the current, it's kind of current yeah. events as it were. Yeah, I think, well, the whole IPCC process really ends up being pretty cautious. You've got a lot of people involved and there has to be some agreement. So um, the more extreme views tend to get uh, toned down, as it were. And, you know, the, these summaries for policymakers have to be agreed by governments line by line. It's a very tedious process, but it does tend to blend things out. And I know I've seen some commentary from Kevin Trenberth in the US and Kiwi scientist who's one of the big names in climate science uh, in the US and globally and he's been pretty scathing about this report essentially saying that um, it's very very toned down very 
wishy-washy on the risks and the changing risks of, of various extremes, and he wasn't impressed at all. Um, that's partly the kind of guy he is, but you know, I, I have to agree to a certain extent that, um, yeah, that the the Estrex could have been harder hitting because I think you know the the business end of climate and climate change is extremes, and the risks of some of these events is changing pretty rapidly or wow. set to change. That, I mean, that's that's really concerning because uh, some of the media reports I've seen have say, said that um, you know that the 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 scientists are, uh, aren't. Um, you know, pulling any punches that um, this is more extreme than we've ever heard before, but you're saying maybe it doesn't go far enough? Um, yeah. Oh, wow. I, I would say it doesn't go far enough. Um, <laughs> in, in some areas, sure, it, it, it's the state of the science, but, yeah, there is a level of caution that goes into these reports, inevitably, just the way the process works. So I'm not saying that everything's worse than it appears in the, the special report, but... As a general rule, I would say such reports tend to be a bit on the conservative side. Hmm. Well, we've had Kevin Tremberth on yeah. the show here, and mm -hmm. um, okay. he was certainly a, a, feist, a feisty subject. But uh, yes, I've noticed his comments as well. And I know um, Kevin feels that we should, um, instead of saying, is this uh, affected by climate change or not, accepting that everything actually is taking place in an atmosphere which contains more water vapour. So we're dealing with a, a changed um, climate at the moment and that every weather event has some component of that change in it. That's true, that's absolutely right. Of course you can't ever point to a storm and say this was caused by climate change, but yeah, Kevin's, Kevin's right that there is a, a small component in everything at the moment because like he says there's more water vapor in the atmosphere now because the climate has warmed up so that is just how the background climate is but yeah climate change is about risks about changing risks so we're increasing the risks of uh, a lot of extreme events mm. without being able to say that yes next week's windstorm is down to climate change uh, Jim yeah. I, I know you've also got some views on on food production as well how, how will um, New Zealand mm fear in, in food? Well, yeah, to me, food production is one of the really big issues, one of the really big worries. New Zealand probably will do okay because we're in a, well, the climate is pretty changeable here. It's pretty uh, windy, well ventilated. Um, so it's going to take quite a lot to shift the climate noticeably in New Zealand, more than it would in some other places. Plus, we've got all these oceans around us, and that buffers us a little bit. So the warming in New Zealand is expected to be somewhat slower than the global mean over the next 100 years yeah, or so. Would you say that, that some warming uh, yeah, in some parts of New Zealand will assist some crops? Oh, yeah, oh, inevitably, yeah, yeah. I think it'll be a process of adapting in the sense of changing uh, what crops we grow and where we have our sheep and cows and so on. I mean, I, I think it would take, it'll be quite a long time before the sorts of agriculture we have now are going to be totally unviable, mm. um, if, if ever. But, you know, that's not such the issue for New Zealand. I think it's what happens elsewhere. You know, we, we depend on global trade. So we depend on our um, trading partners to be there buying our stuff. Mm. And I think, you know, you look at these maps of changes in rainfall that come out of the IPCC that show... You know, large swaths of the globe and the subtropics drying out dramatically and, and other regions in high latitudes wetting up quite a bit. And you know that the production of crops like rice and, and grains and so on, where those crops will grow successfully is going to move around quite a bit. Okay. And, and you don't just pick up the uh, <clears throat> production of rice that feeds 3 billion people and move it thousand or two thousand kilometers north or south overnight you know, I think there'll be a lot of disruption to food production globally and that will engender economic issues so I think that kind of those sort of economic difficulties in, in some of our trading partner nations are likely to impact on New Zealand more directly will, will we will we be seen um, will we be seen as the lucky country by some then I think so, yeah, yeah. I think a, a nice analogy to that is in the 1980s when nuclear winter was the big worry, 
um, I think, at least in the US, a number of people started thinking about moving to New Zealand because if there was nuclear conflict between Ronald Reagan and the Russians, then maybe New Zealand would be relatively safe. Um, luckily, it didn't come to that. Mm, but mm. I think th there's the same kind of thinking going on now, and for good reason. You know, even Australia um, is suffering more directly than we are already with the, the big dries in the south and you know you, you name it that's happening over there it's, it's been in a very extreme climate forever in Australia um, so a lot of people I think are going to look to New Zealand and think well that'll be a good place to go we'll be all right there for the foreseeable future so I think well one we have an obligation to to help others if they need help but two I think a lot of people will want to come to New Zealand we have to decide whether we want to let them come and what we do about it if they want to come anyway. Um, <laughs> yes, that's, that, that's that, that could be a, yeah, so the sort of security issues around all of that. Yeah. Uh, are quite one, a bit one, on. thing I often, one thing I often point out to people is that whilst all New Zealand citizens have uh, the right to go and live in Australia, uh, <laughs> it actually <laughs> works in reverse too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So do we want 20 million coming across the, <laughs> the coastline? Well, it sounds like a recipe for conflict, but I mean, that's one of the results, though, of climate change globally, isn't it? That um, populations will want to move around. Um, yeah, yeah, we haven't seen an awful lot of evidence of that yet. But yeah, that's that's very much an expectation from some of the, you know, groups that study this kind of thing that you make the climate riskier, you make things harsher, and it's not just climate change, of course. Um, water resources, water scarcity, peak oil, etc. Resource scarcity generally, you know, will make people uh, fight over things more, basically. So, yeah, that the, the potential for conflict looks like it's going to go up uh, as time goes on. And I know, again, there are some analysts and, and some government agencies thinking about this and in fact even I remember going to a presentation at Transpower, this was a couple of years ago where they were thinking of various future scenarios and all of these kinds of things that I've seen one of the future scenarios tends to be a kind of a, a fractured conflicted world where there's this sort of regional warfare going on so a lot of people are thinking about this and it, does almost sound far-fetched but i think as as resources become scarcer we are inevitably going to fight over them more mm. yeah absolutely mm. well jim on that rather depressing note <laughs> I, I, yeah. i'd like but, to thank but, you for... but we, yeah, <laughs> we we can we can choose a better future we can yeah clean technology you know you name it all those things um so it's yeah an, i suppose we, 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 as far as extremes are concerned, we've got to be able to adapt to survive. But that, at the same time, we've got to be doing the, the mitigation to try and stop the exactly. worst events happening. Exactly. We don't want to just say, oh dear, this is all too hard and, and roll over. I mean, I think that the amount of mitigation effort we put in now can make a big difference in the future. Um, yeah, climate change is happening and there will be a certain level of climate change regardless. But why? punish ourselves more than we have to. I mean, a lot of the technologies are there already. Yeah, well, that's, that's a, 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 a thought that I can uh, very happily leave this conversation on because we certainly right. do not need to punish ourselves. <laughs> no, Jim, thank you very much for finding the time today. And, yeah, sure uh, thing. We'll look forward to getting you on another time. Yeah, okay, that'll be cool. All right. Thanks, Jim. Nice thank to meet you. you. Cheers. Thanks, guys. Yeah, good to meet you. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Well, that was great talking to Jim. I've been uh, hoping to line him up for the show for some time, and uh, Niwa fingered him as the man to talk to about uh, climate extremes, and I think that was a good interview, don't you, Glenn? Yeah, really really, uh, really nice to meet him, actually, and uh, I hope we, we might get him on uh, next year as well with another year ahead of climate shows. Absolutely. Uh Absolutely. Okay, so it's time to move on to the solutions part of the show where we look at uh, things that might contribute to get us getting us out of this mess that we're in and, and the first item this first item this week i yep. want to talk about um last show we talked about um solar photovoltaics and i've just seen an item on um eco geek that uh, pointing out that california uh, has now got one gigawatt of installed rooftop solar power uh that's puts them 
uh, in the top five. So Germany, Spain, Japan, Italy and the Czech Republic have all done a gigawatt of rooftop solar. And one state in the US, California, now has uh, joined that select band. So is that, so, is that public um, or private or a mix of um, solar panels? No, it's a mix. Okay. Yeah, it's a mix. It's, um, they've got uh, people's uh, roofs on homes having solar panels. There are um, some small utilities and large power generators have got, um, have got sort of solar photovoltaic uh, farms around the place. Uh, so it's apparently equivalent to two coal-fired power plants and is enough to power 750,000 homes. So I think that's a you know, really good bit of news. And it does show that with a certain amount of um, incentive and guidance from government, the, uh, you can, you can uh, make some real progress. And this was a result, it seems, of um, a statewide uh, solar incentive program called the California Solar Initiative. And that initiative alone generated 600 megawatts of installed solar power. So that, that I thought was great news. Very but good. you've got some less less new, less good news out of California, Glenn. Well, you kind of relate to that. Um, Google are doing a, an autumn clean, I suppose you call, call it, being in the um, in the Northern Hemisphere. <laughs> they're, they're, a, fall, a fall clean. A fall it's clean, a fall that's clean. it. Yeah, they don't call it autumn, do they? Fall clean, um, where they're looking at all their products, you know, online products and offline products, and, and uh, working out what works and what doesn't. So they're in the process of um, shutting a number of products down that haven't had the impact that they had actually hoped for. One of them is a renewable energy cheaper than coal initiative launched to drive down the cost of generating solar power was listed among the um, Google undertakings that is being chopped. Um, they've published the results of their research, um, so, so and they're just basically putting it out there, I guess open sourcing it, and um, they're leaving it up to others to advance the state of the power tower technology. Now, haven't we talked about power tower technology in the past? Yeah, we have. Um, it's one of the, th in the last show, we talked about the European, North African, Middle East sort of um, power network that's built around solar towers, the you know, solar thermal generation where um, arrays of mirrors concentrate the sun onto a kind of reactor vessel, which gets very, very hot, generates steam, and yeah. so um, generates, generates electricity. Um, and in some of these things, you can store the heat overnight by using um, molten salts um, to, to basically store the heat so you can basically get um, generation throughout the night. So yes, those, those things are being installed around the world and, and quite big plans for them. What I thought, it does, this doesn't mean, by the way, that Google are giving up on having renewable energy to power their buildings. They've no. still got a, a commitment to renewables in that respect, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Yeah, so they're still going to draw power for their servers from renewable sources. But um, I, I guess maybe this is good. They're, they're, they're being honest. They're saying, well, you know, we're, we're probably not really in the business of developing technology like that. So it was good for us to yeah. give, it, give it a go. And we, we, we've got all this money that we did put into it. I, I do actually hope that um, they will s still give out grants, perhaps, to organizations who do want to put in more research to this rather than being directly involved. Yeah, I, I hope so too. And uh, one thing that struck me about the story was the fact that they were going to open source some of that information. Yeah. Because that that's an interesting sort of geeky computer science thing to do to um, kind of hack these sorts of technologies. And that might be very useful in the future if if uh, instead of having technologies that are proprietary and so locked into one country's um, uh, or one one company's. Um, uh, IP and intellectual property. If uh, if this stuff can be out there and, and kind of uh, op open commons, as it were, yeah. then maybe it, it can get a quicker and wider and cheaper um, adoption globally. Yeah, indeed. Did you? Um, were you uh, moving on now from that? Were you interested in the big seven eight seven, the Air New Zealand seven eight seven Boeing that um, was parked in Auckland? I think it did a tour of New Zealand. Actually, as oh, well. is that the plastic one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The carbon is a carbon fibre body or something. Yeah, it's a composite. They composite, call it, I think. Yeah, very lightweight aircraft. Aircraft. It's the what? Well, it's the Dreamliner. That's right. That's the the common yeah. name for it. Dream Dreamliner. Yeah, absolutely. Um, maybe yeah, perhaps I'll... the Dreamliner in the future might might be powered by something other than um, fossil fuels. <laughs> maybe. Well, it should, yeah. 
well, it should be, should be powered by biofuels. I mean, biofuels are about the only way that um, the, the current generation of jets can actually achieve any meaningful reductions in, in their carbon intensity, as it were. Um, and we know, for instance, that Virgin have put quite a lot of money into trying to develop um, uh, engineered biofuels that can actually replace uh, traditional aviation fuel. But um, I picked up a story again from EcoGeek, a great site for people should follow their RSS feed, um, that commercial jets are now beginning to, um, they've developed a kind of hybrid power system for them. So don't get, don't get me wrong, this doesn't mean that those big jet engines on, <laughs> under the wings um, are yeah. somehow being hybridized or um, being run on electricity. No, what they've developed is a kind of electric motor system that feeds into the um, the undercarriage of the plane. And so they can power themselves um, with what they call the wheel tug system. So and a pair of electric motors in the airplane's nose wheel can get the plane up to 28 miles per hour. And so can do a lot of taxiing um, from those, um, using those electric motors. And that, the, the power for that comes from the auxiliary motor that all these planes have. They all have a, a motor tucked away in the tail somewhere, yeah. um, which runs the air conditioning and electricity power and so on when the plane's not in flight. This provides electric power to the front wheels and means the planes can taxi under their own power without running the main engines. So it's a way of cutting down on fuel use of the plane, but also cutting down on the fuel use that the sort of little flat vehicles, the sort of um, diesel powered tugs that they use to pull aircraft in and out of uh, parking positions, uh, cut down on that. So it's not, not going to be a sort of huge contribution but it's a little contribution and if every jet in the world was fitted with it it would probably add up to being quite a lot well, of would. carbon saved it would, would certainly amount to um to a few aircraft um that might have taken a long haul trip you know it would all add up wouldn't it yeah absolutely um this is all going to be fitted onto 20 ll the israeli airline um jets uh, and should be getting certified by the European and American regulators by early 2013. So, yeah, good news, I thought. Hey, great, Gareth. I think um, that's all the news we have for today, and, 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 and uh, it almost wraps up a show. It does indeed. There are a few things that are happening um, over the next uh, week or two. We've got the election in New Zealand, and no doubt we'll... Um, have some sort of commentary on that uh, when we get back onto the next show in a couple of weeks' time. And we've got some big items coming up. Of course, there's the Durban uh, meeting. Uh, I'm hoping that we'll have a correspondent there that we can talk to. We uh, also then have the fall AGU meeting in early December in San Francisco. And again, I'm hoping that we'll have a correspondent there. In fact, John Cook's going to be there. So we're hoping to get in touch with John. And I'm, I'm very hopeful that we'll get to talk to Jason Box um, in the very near future because the Arctic report card, the annual uh, summary of what's been happening in the Arctic yeah. uh, is going to be released very early in December and Jason's um, been the lead author on the Greenland chapter. So really looking forward to talking to Jason. So Jason, well, you'll be hearing from us soon. Yeah, yeah I can't wait because um, he talks with a lot of passion about that topic and uh, and why not because he sees it firsthand exactly what's going up on up there and some of the photos that he sent back already are just quite shocking. So that'll be cool. Well, in the meantime, you can get, you can get in touch with uh, me. I'm on twitter.com forward slash radio ammo and uh, Gareth is on twitter.com forward slash, what is it, hot, hot, just hot, type again, Z. It's just hot topic NZ, yeah. Yep, and uh, the show is twitter.com forward slash the climate show um, and uh, facebook.com forward slash the climate show. And don't forget the website, theclimateshow.com and hot hyphen topic.co.nz. And if I get around to it, I'll do a Google Plus page for us as well. Oh, yeah, we can do that now. But apparently, you can. Can, you can only be one administrator at a time. They haven't sorted that out yet. Oh, right. You okay. can't well, share it around. <laughs> I. I who knows? It, it might be me. I'll, I'll leave you to look after Facebook. <laughs> all right. We'll do all the geeky, geeky stuff. In the meantime, um, have, have, a, um, have a great time until, uh, until we meet again once again in two weeks. Thanks very much, Gareth. Thanks, Glenn. Speak to you soon. See ya. Bye-bye. What good is a drop in the ocean?